All right, welcome to our lecture on oral language support um, and program models. This is Sam William McCune, Chapter 8, and um, the Dunlap book, Chapter 4. First, I'm going to talk very briefly about developing listening and speaking abilities, um, which our Dunlap Chapter 4 gives us a lot of nice examples of, and then a little more extensively about the different program models for working with English language learners that are discussed in Samway McKeown Chapter 8. So first about supporting listening and speaking, right? Oral proficiency in English is important and really tied to literacy development. Usually we're better speakers than we are readers or writers, and so the more we can develop our speaking ability, um, the more we're going to be able to support our learning as readers. Um, we need to be able to be good readers, especially third grade and above, um, so that we can learn all the academic content we need, okay? So in order to do this, in general, students need abundant and high quality verbal interactions, right? So they need practice, they need a chance. They need some explicit and direct instruction on grammar and usage. So what that means is you're gonna decide, okay, today I'm gonna focus on verb agreement because my students seem to have a problem with that. So I'm actually gonna, you know, that's what my focus is. Um, because you're not going to do everything at the same time, but you're going to pick one thing and give some explicit and direct instruction. Um, there's some focused teaching of patterns and structures, right? How might you put a sentence together? What patterns do you use when you're writing a history essay, etc.? And some do some teaching on that. And then letting students listening first talk later and finding ways to promote academic thinking. So some nice ways to promote academic thinking when you want to scaffold language are analogies, conversation prompts, and semantic feature analyses. Now, because you've seen analogies, you have some nice examples in the text. I'm not going to talk about those very much, but I do want to show you some semantic feature analysis. This is one um, from elementary school. So we have the features of insects, a list of insects, and then the list of different features. And so we are going to be able to easily compare bees, ants, mosquitoes, wasps, and crickets. Um, because we have different features about them, whether they have legs, what kinds of body parts, wings, and whether they lay eggs, if they bite or sting, right? And this is a nice way we can have some academic thinking without having to have extensive um, academic language. And then we can use language to support our discussion of these things. For a high school example, um, here are eras in British literature. We have medieval, renaissance, restoration, romanticism, Victorian, and modernism. And there are different focuses, foci, um, on these different, during these different periods, right? We might have a focus on duty and honor, which we see in medieval and Victorian times, um, known for drama and theater, Renaissance and restoration, um, happening alongside advances in science and Renaissance, Victorian and modernism, um, Renaissance and romanticism being known for poetry and romanticism having an emphasis on nature. Then we're going to be able to talk about these and compare these, um, but this kind of semantic feature chart really helps us do that um, and break it down so we can get at the concept without as much language and then bring in the language and the discussion to scaffold um, our, our, what we're talking about. Um, some other ways to encourage oral language development, right, is to modify the input, which are just things we've talked about with the semantic feature analysis, kind of modified input. Um, they're modified interaction. You have comprehension checks. And when you have a comprehension check with English learners, you never want to say, do you understand? You always want to ask a question that will help student, students show you if they understand. Because if you ask if you understand, every student is going to say yes, right? Because it's polite, and it's nice to the teacher, and they're just going to say yes, right? Um, you might prompt. You might expand on what students say, right? So in the last one, if they say, you know, medieval literature was blank, you're going to then expand and extend their sentence in your reply. You are going to recast what they say, and this is how you correct um, any speech you want to correct, right? So when you focus on form, we'll see that um, in the bottom um, sometimes, right? You might focus on how they're saying what they're saying. Um, if a student were to say, like, I see my brother yesterday and I tell him about class, you're going to respond, yes, it's great that you told your brother about class, right? You're not going to then make that into a mini lesson about tell versus told. Although if you notice that that's a pattern, you might decide to teach that at some point in class, right? Um, and so that kind of correction in the response is called a recast. You do this with little kids, you do this with language learners. Um, 
All right, so the rest we're going to look at examples in class, and now I'd like to spend more time talking about the different program models. So when we talk about program models, we are talking about school-wide ways of organizing instruction for English learners. We are not necessarily talking about one particular strategy. We're talking about how the school is structured, right? So you might see one instructional strategy or technique being used in a variety of different models. Different models require specific types of personnel, um, and in Illinois, the rule is that bilingual education is required to be offered if there are more than 19 students who speak the same language in a school. So you have 20 Polish-speaking kiddos in a middle school. You're supposed to have a bilingual teacher and offer some kind of bilingual education or support. So you have 18 Polish-speaking kiddos and 18 Urdu-speaking kiddos. You are not required to offer bilingual education. You can, um, but you would offer some kind of ESL support because um, you wouldn't necessarily hire a teacher who speaks Urdu and Polish. So if you can find one, that's fantastic. All right, so we have bilingual education models, and we have structured immersion or ESL models. So we have two-way bilingual education, one-way bilingual education, um, and different immersion and dual models. So this is the important chart um, for me, not in your text, um, that kind of compares all these different things. Um, so we have different a variety of kinds of models um, that are for different students with different goals. So we have two-way immersion, which is a program that happens over a number of years, and the idea is um, you have students learning English and a language other than English. That's what this L-O-T-E stands for, because it might be a variety of languages, right, depending on your program. Typically in the U.S., right, 80% of these programs are in Spanish, and then the other 20% are in Vietnamese and um, Mandarin and Polish and a lot of other languages. So the students in this two-way immersion program are the reason we call it two-way is because you have English speakers and you have language other than English speakers. So you have students from um, who come to school speaking English and students who come to school speaking the other language. Um, and then they go to class together and kind of do half and half depending on the school. And the goal is that everybody leaves that school proficient in two languages, right? We have one-way bilingual education in which you it's uh, very similar to two-way, but the difference is who's in it. It's only language other than English speakers. So, for example, it's only Polish speakers. But at the end, the goal of the program is that they are proficient in both English and Polish, right? So they're learning in both. You might have a transitional bilingual education um, that is only a one to three year program and it's kind of a support to transition out of the first language into English, right? It moves you from one to the other. This is only language other than English speakers, right? So maybe Spanish speakers and the goal is English proficiency. Um, so this is probably one of the more common forms of bilingual education in Illinois. Um, although it is not necessarily one of the most effective um, and it's shorter also, right? The idea is um, the goal for that school is only English proficiency, and so the school is only using that second language to support students while they make their way to English proficiency, um, but does not necessarily have the goal of supporting proficiency in that second language. Okay, you can have a foreign language immersion program. Um, this is what I taught in, um, in French immersion. So you have full immersion and adapted content in whatever the focus language is. So my school was French. So I taught mostly English speakers, although it wasn't a rule and I had, I had some Russian speakers and Polish speakers and Chinese speakers and African language speakers. Um, but the goal at the end of these programs is bilingual proficiency. Um, in general, this is not for ESL students. This is for students who are not classified as ESL students but are classified as proficient in English whatever that means when you're a kindergartner, right? Because it's a bit easier to be proficient in English as a kindergartner than as a 10th grader. Um, but in this one, almost all of instruction is in this other language um, because students are already coming and knowing English and the goal is for bilingual proficiency at the end. Okay, so all of those four are probably the least common in the United States, although they're important to learn about. Um, the next two are probably the most common. We have sheltered English instruction, which is where um, you can think of it as push in. So um, English learners, or these language other than English speakers, are in a classroom, maybe where they're learning science, and the science teacher is adapting all of the content um, to those students. And the goal of this program is English proficiency. Um, you have pull-out ESL instruction, which is more tutorial support. You'll see examples of this um, in one of the videos. Also for language other than English speakers, and the goal is English proficiency. So in this one, the ESL teacher is coming, maybe 45 
minutes three days a week um, taking a student or a group of students out and working with them. That is probably the most common program model in the United States. Um, so the question of which works best is a great question because it kind of depends, right? So a badly run dual language program is not going to work as well as a well-run sheltered English program. Um, and so all programs should have high expectations for English learners. All programs should have language and content taught together. So you're never going to teach social studies without considering that you're teaching language too. Um, all programs should have concept development in L1. That means L1 is the student's first language. So if they're learning about homogenous mixtures, right, you should at least introduce that concept um, or connect to it in their first language as you then talk about it in whatever language you're talking about it. All of them should have consistent staff development, a uh, supportive environment, and a supportive leader, right? So if you have a bilingual program, but only the bilingual teacher in the school thinks it's a good idea, everybody else thinks it's a terrible idea and says terrible things about bilingual education all the time, um, it's not going to be super effective, right? Or the principal doesn't think it's a good idea, it's not going to be super effective, right? So you need to have all these things um, in these different programs. Um, when we've done longitudinal studies, this is a longitudinal study from um, the 2000s, uh, 200,000 students, so there should be an extra zero there in California. In general, um, students from bilingual programs had the lowest dropout rate and the highest test scores by high school, and two way immersion we saw is both English speakers and non-English speakers both learning two languages, um, fully close the gap between the outcomes for multilingual and monolingual students. In fact, those students outperformed your average English-speaking student. And the lowest scores, as you might expect, were from students with no language support programs. But if you take a look, um, we have students starting in first grade, right? This is this dotted line is like kind of the median performance on these tests of monolingual, excuse me, sorry. Let's find that again. Um, here we go. Of monolingual English speakers um, is that dotted line. And then this line is student test scores in pullouts. So as you can see, um, they're rising until about fifth grade. And then these students' performance is falling, probably because they didn't have content development in their first language. So they're accessing really complicated content in high school and they don't have the language support or the first language to to help them with that. Um, and you have students, you know, in two-way and one-way dual programs who, you know, their trajectory kind of keeps going up because they have that concept development in their first language and so they're able to scaffold um, and create and excel in high school. Um, transitional bilingual education, right, they kind of, the benefits peter off uh, because um, if you think about first to third grade, they're transitioning out right about this time. Um, and then content, English language development um, students in this study do not do as well. Now I'm having you watch video clips about schools that, the, um, that represent a variety of these programs in addition to something called a language nest that's specifically for my early childhood folks um, because it really is a bilingual program that's focused on fostering first language development in a a preschool environment, typically used with native languages, um, indigenous languages like Native American languages as part of language revitalization, um, making sure that those languages don't die out. So on Tuesday, when I see you, we're going to discuss what you think benefits and drawbacks might be to these different programs. What are the pluses and minuses of pull out ESL, of bilingual, of dual language, and sheltered ESL? Um, so take a look at that and think about that. We also have to think about who they're for. Can you have a bilingual education program if you've got speakers of 10 languages in one school? Um, can you have a dual language program then? Who do you need to staff it? Is it easy to find certain kinds of teachers? Um, those all kind of affect the school's decision making, um, as well as certain kind of political considerations, because sometimes learning more than one language in the United States is seen as a politically dangerous thing, right? Um, so sometimes those are considerations that school districts face as well. Um, so do take a, a look at the different videos. There's also a video called Immersion that discusses what kind of supports a student might need um, and what happens if you don't have any support. Um, so we're going to be discussing that as well.